Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Singbin Lee, and I go by Stephen. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak to you about my work. And to give you a brief introduction of myself, I'm currently the head of Technology Strategy Office at Macrogen, a global genomics analysis company specialized in precision medicine and sequencing technology. Before Macrogen, I earned my PhD from the University of Washington in Seattle under the supervision of the late professor David Nickerson. That said, let's delve into it. Imagine a world where you go see a doctor for drug prescription and he or she knows exactly the right drug and dose based on your DNA sequence. Consequently, there's little to zero concern for adverse drug reaction and maximum efficacy is guaranteed every single time. Sounds too good to be true? Well, today I'm here to tell you that this imaginary world is actually not that far from now, thanks to recent advancements in DNA sequencing technology. As you can see from this chart, the imaginary world was not even imaginable back in the early 2000s when it cost $100 million to sequence one person's genome. However, since the introduction of next generation sequencing or NGS, the cost has plummeted drastically and now it is about $1,000 per genome, which is cheaper than many smartphones. Yet unlike smartphones that get replaced every two years, your genome needs to get sequenced only once. So here's one of my favorite cartoons by Mike Baldwin in 2014 that captures well the public's excitement about NGS by showing how people can get their genome sequenced as casually as if they were going to see a fortune teller. <clears throat> However, as more and more NGS data were generated, scientists quickly realized a new problem, the famous problem of the thousand dollar genome, the million dollar interpretation. As humans, we carry a large amount of genetic variation in over 20,000 or so genes, but not all variants detected by NGS have the same outcome. Therefore, in order for NGS data to be clinically useful, these variants have to be carefully interpreted by scientists, which has been estimated to be worth about $1 million per genome. One way to significantly reduce the cost of genome interpretation is through automation. And today, I will show you how I achieved exactly that, at least for pharmacogenetic data. So here's the overview for my talk. First, I will lay out some background on pharmacogenetics so everyone is on the same page. Next, I'll describe an algorithm that I developed during PhD for automating the interpretation of pharmacogenetic data. After that, I will provide an example of how pharmacogenetic genotypes predicted by my algorithm correlate well with major phenotypes in human liver. I will also show how scalable this algorithm is by applying it to a large and ethnically diverse sample set with over 50,000 people. Finally, I'll finish today's talk by describing my latest work on developing a targeted sequencing panel for clinical pharmacogenetic implementation. <clears throat> so what is pharmacogenetics? In the simplest terms, it's the study of genetic variation underlying differences in drug response. It's been estimated that over 99% of the US population has at least, at least one clinically actionable pharmacogenetic variant. Therefore, if we can systematically test for these pharmacogenetic variants and tailor drug therapy accordingly, we may be able to reduce the number of adverse drug reactions, which is a huge socioeconomic problem globally. Now, generally speaking, there are four stages of a drug's life cycle in the body absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. For the purpose of today's presentation, I'm only gonna focus on metabolism, but it's important to keep in mind that there are other ways pharmacogenetic variants can influence our drug response. So in the human body, most of drug metabolism occurs in the liver and is handled by a class of enzymes known as cytochromes P450 or SIPs. SIFs are one of the largest gene families out there, and some of them are conserved across a wide range of species from eukaryotes to bacteria to even viruses. 
some ships metabolize thousands of endogenous and exogenous chemicals, whereas others have only a few substrates of endogenous origin. And here, when I say metabolism, I mean some form of modification to the substrates, usually oxidation to make these substrates more polar and reactive. And to do that, SIFs need to be able to transfer electrons and they need heme for that, which is an important cofactor for most SIF enzymes function. In the human genome, there are 57 genes including SIF enzymes, but these shown here are responsible for metabolism of most of prescription drugs you will find in the US drugstore today. For example, Viagra is metabolized by CYP3A4, codeine by CYP2D6, and etc. And now I wanna draw your attention to CYP2D6. As you can see, it's the second highest contributor metabolizing about 20 to 25% of the medications, but it's known to have the most inner individual variation in terms of genetic polymorphism and enzymatic activity. Therefore, it's really important precision medicine target. So let's look at CYP2D6 more closely. CYP2D6 is mostly expressed in the liver and activates many commonly used prodrugs. For example, when the opioid codeine arrives to the liver, CYP2D6 activates it to become morphine, which gets transferred to the brain where it reduces the amount of pain that the body thinks it's feeling. However, as I mentioned earlier, there's a considerable amount of variation in CYP2D6 activity, both within and between populations. For example, this plot is showing frequency versus CYP2D6 activity for a typical European population. On the x-axis, the more to the right, the less CYP2D6 activity there is. And you can see that the distribution is not a simple bell curve, but rather multimodal, comprised of four distinct distributions that are labeled as poor, intermediate, normal, and ultra-rapid metabolizers. In the case of European population, it's been estimated that 10% are poor metabolizer and 5% are ultra-rapid metabolizer. Importantly, the shape of this distribution heavily depends on the population you're talking about. For instance, in the Oceania population, uh, it's been estimated that up to 20% are ultra-rapid metabolizer while 1% are poor metabolizer. So where is this functional diversity coming from? Of course, it's coming from genetic polymorphism. The gene has quite complex genomics. If you find CYP2D6 in chromosome 22, you will find its paralog called CYP2D7, which is a pseudogene and by definition is not functional. And they're only 10 kilobase away from each other and they share very high similar uh, sequence high homo homology actually greater than 95%. And when there are two similar sequences right next to each other like that, they can go through non-allelic homologous recombination, creating all sorts of variation. And indeed, that's exactly what we see here. Variations in CYP2D6 include single nucleotide variants or SMVs and small nucleotide insertion deletions or indels and large scale structural variants or SVs. In reality, you find combinations of these variants which are expressed as haplotype patterns or star alleles. In this case, star one is the wild type or reference allele and other variant alleles are assigned a number like star two, star three, and so on and so forth. Genotype analysis of CYP2D6 is difficult because a large fraction of exist existing variation cannot be accurately assessed with a single approach primarily due to the structural variants and the high sequence homology between CYP2D6 and 7. In laboratory settings, oops, uh, several orthogonal genotyping methods are employed to call CYP2D6 variations like qPCR. However, many of these methods are time consuming and heavily biased towards the detection of known variants. In clinical settings, due to practical limitations, understandably, only a handful of major variations, if any, are tested routinely. Finally, NGS data hasn't been explored as much because it's been thought as too complicated for CYP2D6 genotyping. And that's exactly the problem that I attempted to solve during my PhD. 
So SIP 2D6 currently has more than 150 star alleles defined to date. The PGX field has been assessing the enzymatic activity of these star alleles both in vivo and in vitro and came up with a semi-quantitative measurement called activity score or AS. The reference star one allele has a score of one, while the non-functional star four allele has a score of zero because it has a splicing defect, effectively killing the function of the enzyme. There are also alleles with structural variation. For example, the gene deletion allele star five has a score of zero because there's no gene. Notably, CYP2D6 gene duplication has been reported in various star alleles, including those with normal, decreased, and no function. We also have alleles with gene hybrids, like star 36. And finally, these activity scores can be directly mapped to final phenotype predictions as shown in the right. So I mentioned uh, there's a lack of pharmacogenetic testing in the clinics, and it really does have real world consequences even today. For example, there was a tragic incident where a mother of a newborn was prescribed codeine, the opioid, by a doctor for birth related pain. However, neither of them knew that she was an ultra rapid metabolizer and she produced too much of morphine in the system, including her breast milk which resulted in the death of her neonate due to the morphine poisoning. So I think um, that's enough. Um, I think we covered enough of the background. Let's talk about the algorithm that I developed for automating the interpretation of pharmacogenetic data. The algorithm was implemented in Stargazer, a software tool for calling star alleles from next generation sequencing data. When I first developed Stargazer, I use CYP2D6 gene as a model because this gene is one of the most complex genes to genotype in the entire human genome. So our logic was, if we can genotype CYP2D6 accurately, it should be easy to extend the algorithm to other less complex genes. And that was exactly the case. I extended the algorithm to 27 additional pharmacogenes in the next version. In addition to Stargazer, I recently developed a new star allele calling tool termed PyPGX. It's heavily inspired by Stargazer, but it has many improvements compared to its predecessor. A research article describing PyPGX was just published this July, so please check it out if you're interested. But in any case, let's look at the Stargazer algorithm in more details. The pipeline starts with short sequence reads generated by a sequencer. These reads are then mapped to a human reference genome. And from there, it splits into two different paths. In the first path, small variants like SMVs and indels are called directly from sequence reads because these events are smaller than the read length. Now, because humans are deployed, we need to figure out from which of the two chromosomes or haplotypes these SMVs and indels were detected from. For this, Stargazer performs statistical haplotype phasing using population haplotype frequencies as reference solution. And once haplotypes are assembled, Stargazer tests all possible star alleles for a given haplotype and finds the best match. In the other path, to detect structural variation that is bigger than the sequence read length, Stargazer uses read depths to calculate the copy number of CYP2D6. And here, read depths means basically for a given base position, how many sequence reads cover the particular position. To illustrate this uh, real world SV detection, I prepared two samples. The top one does not have any structural variation and that's shown in the copy number plot as everything is in two copies, since we are a uh, diploid organism. The next sample in the bottom has gene deletion event, and that's shown as a reduction in copy number, as you can see in the plot. So once we have candidate star alleles from SMVs and indels that are phased, and also structural variation that's detected from copy number data, uh, Stargazer now combines all of these data to make final diplotype calls, 
which can be easily translated to activity score, which in turn can be used to predict the 2D6 phenotypes. Note that we extensively validated Stargazer using reference DNA materials. They were genotyped for CYP2D6 using five different orthogonal genotyping methods, like Sanger sequencing, qPCR, you name it. And we found that our genotype calls were 99% concordant, which was very exciting. So switching a gear a bit, let's now talk about genotype phenotype association analysis I did because none of it matters if genotype cannot predict phenotype well. So this project was a collaborative effort and it involved a human liver bank, which is really unique data set. It contains targeted DNA sequencing data, cyp 2 to 6 mRNA expression level, protein abundance, and enzymatic activity for more than 300 human liver tissue samples. And I was responsible for applying Stargazer and get accurate cyp 2 to 6 genotypes. I then translated these genotypes into activity scores for association analysis. And as you would expect, we observed a high correlation between cyp 2 to 6 enzymatic activity measured by metabolite formation rate in human liver microsomes versus activity score predicted by Stargazer. And here I'm color coding metabolizer class by activity score. Similarly, we observe a very nice correlation between CYP2D6 protein abundance measured by mass spec uh, versus activity score predicted by Stargazer. And these association analysis really reconfirm how genotyping CYP2D6 prior to drug prescription is important. And we actually did not stop here. Uh, with the targeted sequencing data, we are also able to detect rare variants that have unknown effect. So we functionally characterize some of these variants. So for this, we use humanized yeast with activity-based fluorescent probe to test these individual CYP2D6 variants. So in this plot on the left, the y-axis is CYP2D6 activity normalized to wild type, which is shown in the median gray. Then we have positive controls in light gray, empty vector, an inactive allele, and a reduced functional allele. And you can see that most of rare variants show activity that's comparable to the wild type, but one in particular, A449D, shows reduced activity that's comparable to the known reduced function allele. The even cooler thing is we totally predicted that this variant would have reduced activity. So prior to performing functional experiment, we actually looked at how these variants affect the st uh, structure of CYP2D6 in silico. And we found that this A449D variant occurs at a highly conserved residue that's really close to the heme molecule, which reminding you is very important for electron transfer. Not only that, the change is going from alanine, which is a non-polar and small residue to aspartic acid, which is a polar and bulky. So we hypothesized that this variant could interfere with heme positioning or binding and have significant impact on the function. <clears throat> and voila, we confirmed our hypothesis, which was really cool. So far, <clears throat> I showed Stargazer's um, high accuracy for both genotype and phenotype prediction. One of the major advantages of Stargazer is the ability to genotype large and diverse sample sets efficiently and uniformly. Indeed, I have already applied Stargazer to such sample sets from various collaborators. And in this section, I'll show you one example. But before I do that, let's first discuss about why it's important to study large and diverse sample sets in the first place. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, case in point, a study recently looked at the distribution of ethnicity in 12 randomized prospective trials investigating genotype-guided warfarin dosing and found that 80% of the sample used were European. This lack of exhaustive studies in non-European populations raises the obvious concern whether dosing algorithms derived in European populations can be generalized in more diverse populations, right? And this is particularly concerning because warfarin famously has a very narrow therapeutic window, so you can miss the window. 
Indeed, we are now seeing reports of poor performance of European dry wolfering dosing algorithms in other populations. This could be multiple reasons, but the most likely culprit is that these European drive algorithms probably do not take account for variants that are either very important or common in other ethnic groups. Therefore, enhanced PGX discovery in understudy population really could incentivize the development of dosing algorithms that could benefit diverse ethnic groups. That said, I had the honor of being a part of the TAMME program, which is a US government-led project for whole genome sequencing more than 180,000 ethnically diverse individuals. There, I had an opportunity to apply Stargazer to whole genome sequencing data for about 54,000 of these. So as you would expect, we observed vastly different PGX patterns between populations. Um, this was true at every level from star alleles to activity score, to structural variation, to predictive phenotypes. And this is still the largest single study ever conducted on characterizing CPD6 variation. So in my last remaining few minutes, um, I like to describe my latest work here at Macrogen. Um, targeted sequencing has recently become a common methodology for large scale studies of genetic variation thanks to its favorable balance between low cost, high throughput and deep coverage. And that's why this year I presented ClinFarmSeq, a targeted sequencing panel of 59 genes with associations to uh, pharmacogenetic phenotypes as a platform to explore the relationship between drug response and genetic variation, both common and rare. One major consideration when building CleanFarmSeq was selection of PGX genes as one of the design criteria was to create a panel that could be used for broad implementation of PGX testing, especially clinically while being cost competitive compared to other genotyping platforms such as SNP array. So just to give you some highlights of the design, um, CleanFarmSeq has uh, the 59 genes that overlap with multiple PGX databases like CPIC, FOMVAR, GetRM. Um, the panel targets many important and diverse gene families like SIP, HLA, UGT, Clean farm seq is optimized for detection of structural variation such as CYP2D6 deletion. And the panel is really small, only 0.8 megabase to promote greater multiplexing and lowering cost. So for validation, we sequence DNA from 64 ethnically diverse choreal samples with clean farm seq to call star alleles in 27 genes using PyPGX. These reference samples were extensively characterized by multiple laboratories using PGX testing assays and whole genome sequencing. And our genotype analysis um, showed that our diplotype calls from uh, CleanFarmSeq are highly concordant with that from previous publications or whole genome sequencing. So uh, in conclusion, the I already uh, explained a lot how accurate ident identification of genetic variants contributing to their uh, therapeutic drug response or adverse re uh, reaction is really the first step in implementation in pr uh, precision drug therapy. Uh, I emphasize the comprehensive detection of all forms of variation, not just SMVs, indels, but also structural variation is crucial. Um, again, structural variation aware star allele calling algorithms like Stargazer and PyPGX enables automated and accurate PGX genotyping. And finally, the Clean Farm Seek, the NGS panel, offers a feasible path for broad implementation of PGX testing and optimization of individual drug treatments. Uh, with that, uh, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please send them to me via email. Thank you.